And since we speak, uh, as, as we talk, that has now reached fruition. And there is a subsea pipeline connecting Al Arish with Eskelon. And uh, it, it's, it's quite uh, absurd to think that this pipeline is passing Gaza. Uh, and through the very fields where uh, another vast reserve is in place. Before we explore those two ideas yes. there a little bit further, just explain, because obviously this, this field sort of does cross the border there. How is the drilling, what are the, the varying ways of drilling well, and extracting that Well, first of all, gas? I'd just like to correct that, Amanda. Um, the actual Marine 1 and 2 is exclusively within the EEZ of Gaza. So that doesn't stagger. That, that is there. That is theirs. But there are other fields, as you would find in anywhere else in the world, that do stagger borders. Uh, it's like a lake uh, with, with a border down the middle. Uh, what sometimes happens, and I hope it doesn't happen in this case, that with the types of drilling techniques that take place, it is quite feasible for a rig to be placed in um, Israeli territory, in Israeli waters, and for various means to extract across the border. This is called diagonal or slant drilling. So for some considerable distance, your drill goes down and then it is very carefully manipulated under the border and contained to the resources for some other country. And I think we have a demonstration of that for our viewers as well. Yeah, uh, you can see uh, three, three types. There's, there's the standard vertical one, uh, there's the slant drilling where the rig, uh, the rig is placed at 45 degrees and off it goes. And there's another one, again vertical, but then it, it can plan out. So if you can relate to the trees, uh, the, the roots of a tree is how this works. Uh, it goes out, instead of searching for water, which is what a tree does, it searches for oil or gas. So assuming that's not the case here, well, and we not. go back to our <laughs> other ideas yes. there, um, how viable is it to take this gas into Egypt? Um, it, it's viable. Uh, diplomatically, it, it is the option at the moment, based on Israel's proviso that they will not buy gas directly from Palestine. But it's OK to buy Palestinian gas via Egypt because then Egypt uh, are technically buying the gas and then Israel is taking it uh, in total. I must point out that it's Israel's intention that they want the entire allocation of Gaza for their own usage. So how does uh, liquefied natural gas come into play here? Where well, would that then Well, be? first of all, the gas comes ashore as natural gas down a pipeline um, and then uh, this can be, well, first of all, the power station would have to be uh, modified with uh, industrial gas turbines that are fed off uh, natural gas. Uh, one could say that uh, you could do the same in Gaza as long as, quote, the Israelis would allow the two to connect, which is de debatable. You would have to have a corridor between Gaza and West Bank. And then the, the prosperity for both uh, Gaza and West Bank is beyond imagination. And then if one can say that all public transports and industrial vehicles also run on gas, you can see that they can be just uh, totally independent of having to import from elsewhere. And more importantly, the surplus can be converted into liquefied gas, for which also requires a new facility on the Gaza Strip, a high technology facility that converts the natural gas to liquefied natural gas for export to UK, US or wherever. And that, of course, is also a bonus for the Gazans because they will get the training and there will be uh, mass labour usage uh, of such facilities. So we've got the issue there that it sort of makes sense that in Egypt LNG is happens there because they've already got the technology. Yes. We've got the issue where um, oil power station in Gaza is converted to gas. But politically, what does all this mean? <laughs> Uh, the political side is, uh, is very hard to understand because um, you've got a split within Gaza between uh, Fatah and Hamas. Uh, for the success for this, they've really got to come together. And then having come together, uh, the United Nations really has to do its job and, and help police take away this friction. And then Israel has no choice uh, to say that Gaza is now truly independent. It is a recognized sovereign state through the United Nations. Uh, it has control of its borders, its air, airspace and its sea space. And more importantly, it can do what it wants with its own reserves. And no country has the right to rape Gaza of this commodity that is rightfully their own. And, and the revenue from this, uh, I must emphasise that this is a small drop in the ocean when one considers that en entire area is 200 nautical miles out to sea for the EEZ, there are many more gas fields besides this one, believe me. The area is inundated. 
So, of course, be optimistic. Uh, Gaza could become a small Dubai in the future, and very quickly. Peter, it's obviously a very complex issue and one we'd love to return to talk to you about in the near future. Sure. But for the moment, thank you. Thank you. Now, air pollution from transport in Oslo has increased by about 10% in just under a decade and contributes to more than half of the city's CO2 emissions. Since Norway has an ambitious target of being carbon neutral by 2050, Oslo City Council has started investigating alternative transport fuels such as biomethane. Dr. Ole Jacob Johansson from Oslo Sewage Works is on the line to tell us more. Uh, what exactly is biomethane? Yeah, biomethane is purified uh, biogas. And the biogas uh, we are using is produced uh, uh, when bacteria feed on organic waste, such as sewage sludge. The process takes place in an oxygen-free oxygen chamber. And uh, the result is a biogas containing two-thirds of methane and one-third of uh, carbon dioxide. By how much can this source reduce carbon emissions? You know, this uh, theoretically it can uh, uh, reduce quite a lot, but uh, in practice, on, if you are using it on uh, buses, for instance, uh, you can reduce uh, uh, carbon uh, dioxide uh, emissions by more than 70%. What is the actual power potential of this idea? You know that you are uh, you are um, producing the biomethane or uh, biogas from uh, sewage and kitchen uh, waste. And uh, for instance, in uh, Oslo, we uh, that's uh, five hundred and five hundred and fifty thousand inhabitants, and they can produce enough uh, biogas or. Uh, Biomethane for running about uh, a bus fleet of about f uh, 400 uh, buses. And uh, these uh, buses will reduce uh, the total emission of the Oslo by uh, nearly 10%. And compared with uh, buses run on diesel, they reduce the CO2, CO2 uh, emissions by uh, more than 70%. How cost-effective is this idea? Oh, pardon? What are the costs involved in this idea? You know, it's, uh, it's quite uh, both uh, energy and cost-efficient. And uh, uh, the, as I told uh, earlier, the biogas has to be upgraded to biomethane and compressed and used as vehicle fuel. And uh, the total uh, cost is uh, for, for the fuel is uh, actually lower than uh, the diesel, and, uh, about 20% uh, lower than, uh, than the diesel. And, uh, and uh, the total cost is about uh, 0.7 euro per liter uh, diesel equivalent. Where else is this being developed and how successful has it been? You know, it's, uh, in, in Sweden there is uh, running more than 100 buses uh, on uh, biogas or biomethane from mainly from uh, sewage treatment and uh, the operation is uh, very successful and, uh, and uh, they have no problem as uh, to, to up to now and you know this uh, they, this biogas or uh, biomethane is uh, nearly the same as uh, natural gas but uh, the natural gas uh, they is not uh, not uh, carbon dioxide free, so it's quite different uh, in uh, in that way because uh, uh, that's um, natural gas is uh, is um, as a fossil fuel and uh, and. Uh, the biomethane is... Uh, is um... Dr. Johansson, thank you. It was lovely talking yeah. to you. Good luck with that.